I didn't wear a tie so cool again. I'm glad you all came. I'm glad you. I just pull up a bit of grass. Sit wherever you like. I need more jackets. A thermos. Something to keep warm. It's good to be here together. The sun about to set. <laughs> I did think we could probably do a few activities while we're waiting, but no. I think we just wait till she gets here. Yeah. She said 6.45, I must be coming up pretty close. She'll approach. She'll approach us very carefully, very considerately, taking time to look every one of us in the face. And when she looks, it's as though she's 
coming from another place. Your eyes have a way of piercing the soul. Crystal blue. She'll approach the chair that we've left for her. She will bow, she will circle and seat. And as we watch the sun beginning to set, the sky turning to orange, she starts to rock, slowly at first. And the flames and the fire flicking just a little bit more loudly. She bought it at the op shop, she thought it was pretty. Had flowers on the side, black enamel. There was something about it that drew her to it. I must be yours, I love you, Smith. And uh, so it was. She took it on the counter. Just five dollars. And for the last three years that Amphora has been sitting on her buffet above the crystal ware and the porcelain. And every night before going to bed, she would look at the flowers and the pictures of Bacchus. Greek gods that she couldn't think of the names of, the strange spiral designs, and she would find herself just losing perspective. She would stare at it for hours and then realize the time had gone to bed. After three years of this rowing obsession, these watch sports the two bars turning out to be uh, something more special than that, it became her life. She would carry it with her in her bag. And then, uh, you know the rest, that's why you're here. Run the ball, sky, the high ball, stand, centre, centre, weasel, rise, finger, down to me. Ah, oh, gosh, she hear voices. She only hear it speaking for her. What I was coming from. Ah, it would vibrate. It would ah, resonate in her bones, and she would not be able to stop moving. And turn her moving her lips and think she would fall the wood on her, and she'd be holding herself up. Yeah. In the middle of the shopping centre, waving her arms about, and people were looking at her strangely. And then, but then some people suddenly realised that maybe there was some beauty, some strangeness, and some mystery in what she was doing. And they started to follow her around. And then they would say, What are you going to be doing now, Alex? Where are you going? Where? No, it was on social media. 
<laughs> that was really the beginning of it. And Laurie Smith will be at High Point Shopping Center at 1 p.m. Tuesday, the 23rd of July. The people will start to come just to see his strange object as she danced about. Her precious vase. And then, she realized that she was not dancing alone. As she stands, in the shadow, on the edge of beginning and ending. She feels their gentle touches. She hears the creaking of their steps. Grey shadows, faceless, they follow her. Moving, burgeoning, stretching from the earth, creaking and groaning. But she's no longer in high point. She's a, uh, maybe it's a low point. <laughs> It's no point at all. It's a, a black, empty world full of hungry, ghost-like creatures who follow her every move. The follow on of course, is, uh, well, it's kind of obvious. She soon learned that not only could she lead these creatures in the dance, she could whisper in their ears and command them to go and do things at her bidding, to fill the coins for pocket. To listen in on secrets, to tell the fortune of anyone that she was interested in. These creatures knew passwords. They lived in the dark web. They spiraled around the cryptic places. They knew how to unlock any door, no matter how well sealed. They could dance their way through. They knew the moves. They knew what rhythm it would take to shatter glass and walls. They knew how to break through and that gave her the most
So the sun had just set. She's arrived at the campsite at 6.45. She sits in the chair and I'm watching her, fascinated. I've been following her for a while. I like to think we're friends. She accepted my invitation. <laughs> And when she got here, she, she looked right at me. And I, I felt like she was looking in me, through me. She was cracking every secret that I ever had. She could see into my heart, beneath my ribs, in my deepest hidden places, somewhere inside my <coughs> cerebellum and my memory stores and inside my cells and she could, she had a way of prizing me away from my own reality. <laughs> my feet, as she looked at me, but oh, I touched the ground. I was floating, free of all constraints. I was told that if I sit back here, I have to project my voice a bit, so I love you! She holds up the amphora, filled with a golden liquid. And she proceeds to pour it onto her scalp. And like honey, it oozes down over her ears, down her neck down her breasts and chest. It's all over her body, covering her in this thick golden sheen. And she stands, hands aloft, and says, they're coming. We don't know who she's talking about. <laughs> They're coming, she said. They're coming. Ah, ah, ah. <laughs> so we all bend back our heads. We crane our necks, looking up into the heavens of the freshly darkened sky. The stars start to erupt and come out. And that's 